Welcome back, guys. It's Steve from Featherlight. In the last episode, we learned all about the importance of gain staging in hardware. In this episode, we're going to learn all about the importance of gain staging in software and how you group your buses, use your plugins, and string all of that together is responsible for your mixes sounding punchy and dynamic or lifeless. Let's dive in and check it out. Back in the day when we were recording into analog tape machines, we could record the levels into them pretty hot. And we could push the levels of the VU meter and achieve some pretty musical and desirable saturation that sounded great on a lot of records. Fast forward to the first couple of digital audio workstations of the time period, and those engines were built around 16-bit technology. So that had a definite sound to it, and it struggled to represent all the dynamic range needed, not just to record the music, but also to do all the computations in the background. Back then, digital clipping was a constant concern, both from tracks into buses and then from buses into your final two bus. You were constantly struggling against the limited dynamic range and headroom that those low bitrate engines provided. And of course, this was all dependent on your audio interface or interface cards capturing high quality signal before the computer ever got a chance to work on it. Fast forward to modern day and a mind-numbing array of things have changed and improved. We have long since left the world of 16-bit audio behind, and now most digital audio workstations, including Cubase, use 32-bit floating point for their engines. And Cubase, the newer versions, can even use 64-bit. That gives us a theoretical dynamic range of over 384 dB. And what this means for us in the real world is that now it becomes mathematically almost impossible to actually audibly distort the output of one plugin, for example, going into another plugin, if they're coded correctly, or a set of tracks going into groups or groups going into other groups and buses. So with all that dynamic range, is the practice of gain staging even relevant any longer in the digital realm, especially for those who work completely inside the box? With all of these technological advances, one thing is for sure, we definitely don't have to stress about it as much as we did in the past. However, there are still four major categories where gain staging plays a major part in your mix process. The initial project levels, plug-in to plug-in, hybrid setups, and buses and masters. Let's check them out. All right, so the first of four considerations that still makes gain staging important in a modern day digital audio workstation is workflow. And workflow really begins with getting proper levels. And as we learned in the last video, if we get those levels right at the analog stage, by the time we get here to the mix stage, this is so much easier. So what we have here is a big rap project with a lot of parts. We've got leads and we got hooks, we got music, we got all this different stuff. Sounds like this. All right, so you can hear we got a big dynamic lead vocal. This particular lead vocal was recorded with two different mics for the same performance. So one of the mics was a little hot, the other one was a little low. And we need to get these levels in the ballpark at the beginning of our mix stage. All right, so what do we mean when we see healthy levels? What we're talking about is shooting for having our recorded audio before we do anything to it, before it hits the EQ or the faders or any processing or inserts, so that it shows up on our meter bridge here, somewhere between negative 18 and negative 12 dB on the full scale meter here. So it looks like this with all of our faders set at unity. And that's the little zero marker here. And we're talking about an average. This is a ballpark. It doesn't have to be exact, but it just means that if you start off with your levels before you do anything to them, metering somewhere around these areas, the way they interact with effects and everything downstream will be so much easier and your mixes will be so much easier to manage. So that's really the first step in the workflow is to get all the levels in the ballpark so that they're good, healthy levels before we start our mix process. And Cubase gives us two ways to accomplish that. The first is known as clip gain. You might have heard of it in other DAWs as well. Pro Tools also has this feature. And this allows us, for example, because of that 32-bit float engine, to come up here, you'll see the little square here right at the top of the clip. We can simply click and drag that and pull this down to a much healthier level. We can do the same with the bottom clip as well. We can grab that and then we can bring that up. Of course, the reason we can get away with this is because that 32-bit float engine allows us theoretical unlimited headroom. So we can drag these waves to the shape that we need. Once they're in the ballpark, all of the downstream processing is going to be a lot more consistent, including EQs and compressors and whatever's downstream from these waves. But 
that may not be the most effective depending on the kind of project you're working on. So let's pan over here to a different section of the song. This is the hook section. If you do a lot of EDM or if you do a lot of pattern-based recording that has lots of little clips, Cubase gives us another way to accomplish this. So for example, here in the hook section, we've got a bunch of little clips that are all edited together. Some of this involves different volumes and things. Sounds like this. All right, so in this case, we got a bunch of different clips stuck together that are differing volume levels. And we need to get all those in the ballpark as well before we continue on with the actual mix process. So the second way to accomplish this is to go to the track itself and click on the edit window. This brings up the channel settings for the track. This is all the relevant settings that apply to that track. And the most important of these is this section right here. This is the pre section. And we got a couple different controls here. So we got a low cut filter, a high cut filter, and we've got a phase button here that can reverse the phase. And the most important of these is this, the pre gain button right here. This works exactly like the gain plugin in Logic or the trim plugin in Pro Tools. Effectively, what this allows us to do is to change the gain of the track. However, the difference here is that it's before all the downstream processing, just like in an analog mixer, before the inserts, before the strip, before the channel strip, before the EQ, everything. So this literally works exactly the same way that a gain or trim knob does on an analog mixer. This may be a much better way to get all those in a ballpark first than trying to adjust each one of these individually. We can also get to that same function by going to the console view and looking up here in the tabs area for the pre tab. If you don't see it, we can go up here to the racks area and simply click on the down arrow and click on it and enable that particular view. And now those pre functions will be available. If you click on them, you can see them here. We have the same high and low cut filter and the gain button here is the same one we saw in knob form in our channel edit settings. And of course we have the phase switch as well. So there's two ways to get our audio in the ballpark at the beginning of our project before we even start the mix process. Cubase's clip gain feature and then by using the pre gain knob in our channel settings edit window. The second of our audio gain staging considerations deals with the way one plugin affects another plugin. Not because we'll hear audible distortion or clipping from one to another. Our 32 bit float engine guarantees we have almost unlimited headroom, but more because of the way one plugin can affect another plugin, specifically the way one can affect the behavior of a plugin. So, for example, we got a drums bus here with some effects on it. We have an EQ, and that's being followed by. And 1176, this is part of the Waves collection, and it accurately emulates the behavior of its analog counterparts. Specifically, it expects to see about a zero dB voltage in the analog world as an input. The digital equivalent to that is about negative 18 dBFS, or full scale. So it doesn't mean it's going to clip or distort, but it is going to change its behavior. So watch what happens when we start making changes to the equalizer that's on our drums bus that's upstream from the compressor. So it's done a couple of things here. As we added bottom end to the EQ, we changed the output level of it going into the compressor. So the compressor saw more input level and changed its threshold settings in addition to clipping its analog emulated input level. In this case, it's because the 1176 doesn't have a threshold knob on it. It only has an input knob. So this one controller is controlling both those features, which means the more level it sees, whether it comes from the input knob or it comes from the signal directly above it feeding into it, the more compression it's going to apply. And this is why there's a volume output slider on the EQ itself. Any changes we make to the EQ isn't just changing its tonal balance, it's also changing the volume of the output signal. And this slider allows us to accommodate for those differences. We don't want to just keep making things louder from plug-in to plug-in to plug-in. Our ears are easily fooled by hearing louder things and thinking they sound better. So that's what the bypass switches are for on all of the plugins. It allows us to try to match as closely as we can the volume coming in to the volume going out. That way we're just listening to the effect itself and not the additional volume that each plugin is adding leading to runaway game problems later. If you're using third-party plugs that don't have a volume adjustment on them, this EQ plugin by Cubase makes a great gain adjustment control. This concept of keeping the gain structure going in and out of the plugins relatively the same is known as unity gain mixing, and it pays dividends later in the mixing process. 
The third situation where gain staging is still really important is this one. This is a hybrid recording setup. And what this means is that we want to use one of our outboard pieces of hardware inside the digital world of Cubase. So we have to send audio back out into the real analog world. So we'll need to make some gain staging considerations because the hardware we're going to be plugging into won't have anywhere near that dynamic range and headroom. We'll dive deeper into using external hardware in a future episode. But for the time being, what this means is that we're going to make a round trip out of Cubase and then we're going to go through our audio interfaces digital to audio converters and then we're going to go into our effects processor in this case the 1176 and then back again and all those connections are not going to have nearly the same dynamic range that our 32-bit float engine does inside of Cubase. So we need to make sure that the levels we send outside of Cubase are within the ballpark that our outboard gear can tolerate. Otherwise, we're going to have to deal with that issue of distortion and clipping all over again on the way back in. Most of our analog hardware expects to see somewhere around a 0 dB input voltage, which equals a negative 18 dBFS in the digital world. So thankfully, Cubase gives us a way to adjust for that when we set up an external processor, which can be found under the studio menu. Simply navigate down to audio connections and then over to the external effects tab. Here we can make adjustments to our send and return gains to match our analog hardware. And the fourth and final configuration that we still need to consider gain staging with all the headroom we have available to us in Cubase is in buses and masters. So we got a big rock project here that we're nearing the end of. We got all of our tracks on the left. We got all of our groups and buses on the right, and they all spill into our master fader over here on the far right. This example shows a really dense part of the mix. Let's keep our eye on the master fader area. All right, so as you can see, it didn't take very long to clip the master bus because all of these individual groups and buses have their own volumes and they all get added together and have to make it out that master bus. But because we're still in the relative safety of the 32-bit floating point world, we could just turn this down until it stops clipping because we have all of that headroom to deal with. But at some point, we need to get our audio out into the real world, and that's gonna involve a couple of different steps. So the first thing that's gotta happen is our audio has to make it out our audio interface so we can hear it through our studio monitors, which means all of these tracks that up until now, the tracks and the groups and the buses, they all live in the 32-bit floating world. But our master fader does not. Our master fader is gonna go directly to our audio interface, which is more than likely a 24-bit digital to audio converter. And that's not gonna have anywhere near the same dynamic range as we do in software for our mix engine. So it is absolutely possible to clip and distort that. We'll get into mastering in a different episode altogether. That's a much bigger conversation than we have time for. But there are a lot of reasons why we do not want to clip our master bus. Right now, at the mix or the end of the mix stage of a project, you may have no idea where your music is going to end up or what you're going to do with it. For example, you might want to press it into physical media like CDs or vinyl, or you might want to print it out your audio interface and go into an analog two track master. You might end up streaming the information. You might end up sending it off to somebody to master, or you might want to master it yourself. And all of those scenarios are possible if we don't clip that master bus. If we do clip it, however, some of those options won't be. Cubase gives us lots of good ways to find out if we're close to clipping or not. And one of them is the Cubase peak metering system. It's located over here on the right-hand side. And if you're not seeing it, simply go up to this area here, navigate up to these two boxes, and click on the right-hand side one, and this enables Cubase's metering system. And we have a couple of different ones. In the main meter area here, which is the first tab, this measures both RMS and peak value. So we can see we're between minus 20 and minus 15 RMS. And some of these peaks have gotten quite high because we've already clipped in parts of it. And on the other tab, we have the loudness meter. This is where we can measure LUFS and a lot of other things in a variety of different parts. We can do integrated, short-term, momentary, and it gives us true peak metering as well. All 
All right, so we can tell that the average loudness of the track, not the peak, but the loudness, the overall apparent loudness over time, is about negative 14, and it's bouncing somewhere between negative 13 and negative 15. So for the time being, especially since we don't have any limiters or compressors on our master bus, that's not a bad level as long as we're not clipping. But as you can see here on our true peak indicator, we have. We've gone 1.2 dB over that. So this is a great way to accurately meter where you really are in your audio world. So while it's true, you could simply turn this down, reset your meter, and play it again. We could go to the loudness meter. Alright, and you can see we're well underneath that digital zero mark there. Or we could engage our compressor and our limiters that we have on our two bus, reset the master fader back to zero and let our limiter on the two bus make sure we're not clipping instead. All right, so as you can see over here on our average loudness meter, our true peak is still under Digital zero, but not by very much, and that's because of the ceiling that we've set here in our limiter. If we give ourselves a little bit more headroom in that, then we can edge that even a little more. Even with all of this precaution, we're still way too close to the top of our headroom for comfortable working. We really don't need to even be anywhere near this close to it and can afford to really back these levels off even more and still have nice, solid working project volumes. All right, so what's the takeaway from all of this? Even though we live in a 32-bit mix floating point world and 64-bit if you work inside of Cubase, it still makes a lot of sense to keep your track levels, your group levels, and your bus levels at moderate levels. So by the time they all get routed to our stereo output, we're not clipping that output. And if we are, it really is just as simple as clip selecting all your groups and buses, go up to Quick Link, and then grab these and drop them a little bit. And that gives us a little bit of headroom into our master slider so that we're no longer clipping that. And that's without effects on our two bus. Is this absolutely necessary like it used to be back in the day? No, but it will definitely make your mixing workflow a lot more consistent. If you're the kind of person that likes to mix into a compressor or a limiter or both in your mix because that sound appeals to you, and that does to an awful lot of people nowadays, setting that last processor in the post position so that its output is considerably less than digital zero, gives us a lot of headroom to play with. So we can see now on our meter. The, we are well under that digital zero mark on our true peak indicator here. Now, if we were gonna send this off to be mastered by someone else, probably we would remove these or they might be different settings. But by those, and by changing the level of your groups and buses into your master fader, those kinds of gain staging considerations can make your life a lot easier because by not clipping your master bus, all of those audio options we talked about earlier are always available to you. You're not limiting yourself. So this is really for your benefit. All right, so that's gain staging in the digital world. If you learned something or if this was helpful in any way, please remember to hit the subscribe and notification bells, and we'll catch you guys in the next video.